Good day, viewers, and welcome to the Anorak Review Show, with I, your host, the Anorak. Back in my 20th episode, I reviewed the Marillion album, Anorachnophobia, a deliberate attempt from the band to do something very different from their traditional neo-prog sounds, and it was also the inspiration behind the name of this little show. And today, I'm going to look at another album from Marillion's ongoing Hogarth era, with an album that was released five years ago and has a title that's probably somewhat controversial to say the least. But it but its acronym does go by the simple title of Fear. Now the cover itself is very simple and very and very minimalistic, which I do love. It basically basically it's basically a gold plating depicting the Sitting the very word itself, fear, and the and the very type, the very words it stands for, F everyone and run, which I'm sure everyone knows what the F stands for. Just for something that's, uh, but for a very minimalist cover, it does have some neat details to it. One of which being the A symbol, which, which has the 18 and U, obviously referencing the the symbol for gold. Or the periodic table, which kind of which kind of goes along with not only the cover itself, but also kind of reoccurring theme on the album itself, and the the UN in run, in the R, obviously it spells out run, but it can also stand for United Nations, which kind of connects to the theme of countries and politics, which also goes along with the album, and being a double album. Is, is also a gatefold, with some more simple, minimalistic, and yet gorgeous artwork. All this was done by a man named Simon Ward, and if what I've looked up is true, this was, this was compute, this was all cool, this was all textured and generated on a computer. And if I, and first time seeing this, I would never would have guessed that. I would never would have guessed this was all modeled on a computer. Now, being a double album, reviewing this is going to be a bit more challenging, and not helped by the fact that there are that most of the songs are pretty long, multi-part sweets, in fact. And the vinyl version has a slightly different order from the track from it from its CD format, having to kind of rearrange some some certain tracks and songs on the album to better fit and accommodate the two vinyls. So to help to help this make this a consistent three-parter video, I'm going to go by the, the order of the CD format just for a bit of convenience. But with all that out of the way, let's talk about this album and see if it holds up after five years. Beginning the, beginning the album is the first suite of the album, El Dorado, which is named after a, a very mythical tribal chief that some have believed had covered himself entirely in gold. Someone who was something that was very, very well known in Colombian and Mesoamerican folklore and mythology. But over time, it came to be referred to a mythical city built entirely out of gold. Or, to certain DreamWorks fans, native for Great Big Rock. Now, the first section of this suite is simply titled Long Shadow Sun. I gotta wonder, how exactly does does a sun have a shadow if, it, if it's basically a big ball of light? Huh. Well, anyways, this is a very short but very sweet and soothing beginner to this album, with nothing but a calming, chill acoustic guitar and some distorted guitars. Steve Hogarth kind of sings out the very, very poetic and very simple descriptions of the ideal English summer, very much like Pink Floyd's Pink Floyd's Grandchester Meadows. It even has some brief sound effects of birds chirping and kind of, kind of like, kind of giving off this kind of, giving off this very bright, summery feel. 
And he goes on to kind of address how nothing in England really changes, but the weather does. And honestly, he's kind of right in saying that British weather always changes. He's not wrong in that. However, it's in part two, the gold, where things already start to get somewhat ominous, if not very tragic. And with a title like The Gold, you can imagine this particular song's about tin, copper, and nickel. Nah, just kidding. In this, Hogarth sings about gold itself, how we obsess over it, how we fight over it, how it apparently took more lives than uranium and plutonium, which, might I remind you, were used to create atomic and nuclear bombs. Really think about that. Really? Yeah. Anyways, it's here where we also get the first mention of the word fear, which the inner sleeves like to make really clear by having every mention of that word in all caps. Get it? Because the album title is FEAR, as in a tile drop. Get it? I don't know. That aside though, this is another good, good piece to the Eldorado Suite, and it ends with a very epic guitar solo by sole continuous member of the group, Steve Rothery, who definitely gives it his all with this guitar solo alone, and it sakes perfectly well to the next section. And that next section is called Demolished Lives. We kind of calm down after the last chord of Rothery's guitar into something a bit more chill and ambient, almost like something out of The Division Bell or Endless River by Pink Floyd. And here, Hogarth kind of sings about how people at the borders seem to wait and want to cross again, almost kind of relevant to the migra migration crisis that was going on here in the UK at the time. And how, and he references the haves and the have-nothings. Obviously referring to the rich, the poor, and those in between. What I really like about this album so far is how it kind of paints this kind of ambiguous world. No one's innocent, no one's entirely guilty either. We're all kind of guilty and we're all in this. It doesn't paint paint a certain group or an individual as the sole bad bad guy or the cause of all the pain and suffering. All have all have have a have have a part in some way or another in this slow but eventual crisis. And and any good in any good suite, it kind of re kind of repeats the refrain of the gold stops us. The gold always had kind of ref obviously referring back to the kind of greed for wealth and power that a lot of people are prone to. And there's even a, even a line here that refers to a man being beheaded on a smartphone, which, which is obviously a bit of a nod to how terrorist groups like ISIS and, Kaye, and Al Qaeda would often not only torture and behead their victims and prisoners, but they would record them, film them, and post them online for all to see. And something like that actually ha something like that actually happens in real life. And it shows how scary and terrifying the real world can be. And it's songs like this that kind of help us cope and deal with such a dark reality. Then we come to one of the two title tracks of the album. Well, I say two since, well, this album technically has two titles. This one being simply titled FEAR. In all caps, of course. This is definitely the, a, a more gloomy track. Very Radiohead-esque, or at least reminiscent of something out of Afraid of Sunlight, for instance. 
in this, Hogarth kind of sings about the fears and the effects of war, how, how it's caused, the motivations behind it like wealth, power, domination, etc. And the excuses used to justify it like religion, race, and nations, and ethi ethics, and so on. It also kind of, it also kind of, it also sings the phrase of, of when the pe when the papers stir it, even though our fears deny it. Kind of referencing how newspapers and kind of news in general would often kind of dramatize or kind of, kind of twist truths in some way to kind of, kind of manipulate and kind of, kind of almost guilt trip its viewers and listeners. And to, into believing their truth, their facts, and kind of, kind of guilt them into into believing it in a way, or at least the fear and possibility that what we hear and see on the news may not entirely be as true as we might have been led to believe. And when Hogarth sings about how you can't see into his head. He, something's cooking inside him and he's becoming hard to live with. Either it turns out he's actually a living, walking kitchen with like little tiny chefs and everything. Or that he's getting a little bit crazy and driven to near brink of insanity. Just from the mere fears of wars and conflicts alone. So we come to the last section of El Dorado. The Grandchildren of Apes. This is where things start to definitely end out with a calming, soothing climax. With mostly an acoustic guitar and piano, Hogarth gives up, pretty much channels Tom York at this point as he sings about how we're, well, well, the Grandchildren of Apes, refer referencing how we evolved from ancient primates and apes and all that. And how we're not we're not grandchildren of angels, of kind of referencing the belief of God and Jesus, angels and and all those religious stuff, and how we're often often embedded with feelings of fear. After all, if Lovecraft is is, any, is anything to be believed, fear is the oldest emotion of mankind and. The oldest fear of mankind had is fear of the unknown, and but regardless, Hogarth still ends us off with a, with a very hopeful note, telling us how if we let go of our fears, if we if we just recognize them, we just realize them, confronted them, and got them over with, then once we've cleared our minds, we could become angels, or we could become like angels enlightened, hopeful, optimistic, joyful, and working together to an eventual future of prosperity and, for lack of a better word, hope. Hope and charity. Hope and glory. After that, we then come to the, to the first proper single song of the album, Living in Fear. Close to being a third title track, but it does have the have the term "living in" in its name, so that doesn't exactly count. This is one of those songs I would most likely call both fearful and hopeful at the same time, though that can easily be sa said to the album as a whole. But I digress. Beginning with some very interesting and very well recorded, almost James Bond esque pianos. Steve H starts off by singing how our eyes aren't weak or naive, they're the, pro they're the conscious products of our decisions and our wisdom. How, what, how what we, we, often see, we often believe what we see, and yet at the same time, how so easily it could be swayed and deceived. Our senses can be easily manipulated and prone to illusion. And he goes off to say how smiling is the new cool, 
kind of referencing how smiling is often a sign of genuine, sincere happiness, but also as a way to kind of hide and kind of, kind of block off people from our negative feelings and emotions, such as our fears and our hatreds. And he also references phrases such as Turn, turning the other cheek, how we often often try to be more pacifistic even in times of potential crisis and war and all that. Even there's also a reoccurring phrase of we risked melting our guns as a, as a, as a sign of strength. Almost kind of trying to saying that trying to trying to dissuade ourselves from any form of violence, much like someone like, say, Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. did, we would be able to earn the solution to our problems. We'd be able to earn true peace and order, rather than just going straight to violent solutions, thinking that they'll be they'll easily solve our problems, but really they just kind of build up on those problems. But anyways, the song does end out with H going about, like, going on stuff about the Maginot Line and the Great Wall of China and how it all is just one big waste of time and effort to just even create these historical but still somewhat pointless monuments in the end. And he even goes on to sing a bit in German and Russian, which, as someone who's not very big on languages myself, that alone has got to be impressive. But the song itself as a whole is still very impressive. We got, we still got some great guitars and synth and very good percussion. A lot of people often consider Marillion as a kind of continuation on Gen Genesis's old 70s prog sound. But with songs like this, I often start to see them as, as more of a continuation and expansion of the Pink Floyd sound, in particular the post Roger Waters era, like Momentary Lapse of Reason onwards. And this is honestly an, another good song of Marillion, and and it, and it goes to show that you don't, ha don't have to be a big Fish fan to still like post Fish Marillion.